Uh, my topic tonight is the Reformed tradition beyond Calvin. Now, that, that very title could confuse you. In fact, I was talking with Tim before we started, and he was saying, so are you going to do post-Reformation Reformed theology? Are you going to take us from Calvin into the 17th century and 18th century and beyond? And that would be very interesting. I've been interested in that subject since my master's work. Uh, you see, there's a great debate about whether the successors to the Reformers were faithful to their theology. And so, 25 years ago, people were writing books with titles like Calvin versus the Calvinists, in which they argued that John Calvin was not a Calvinist and that the Calvinists had misunderstood John Calvin. Uh, and had uh, deviated from certain emphases of his teaching. That would be a very interesting thing to talk about. And I would want to commend to you wonderful work that has been done in that area by scholars like Richard Muller, who really turned the tide. When Richard Muller was writing his PhD at Duke, the dominant scholarship viewed 17th century reform thought as in some kind of a fundamental discontinuity with 16th century reform thought. And Richard Muller almost single-handedly changed that, that whole situation. And then since his time, he's pumped out PhD students left and right that have been working in this area and really enriching our understanding of the development of the Reformation. So that would be a great talk. I would, I would love to do a talk like that. And the title even sounds like it might be like that. The Reformation beyond Calvin. Where did it go after Calvin? But that's actually not the assignment that I got. I went back a number of months ago and I looked at the email that Tim Kel that um, Don Carson had sent me over two years ago inviting me to give this talk just to make sure that I was doing what he told me to do and this is what he said. He's describing all of the talks, three plenary talks will recount God's work in and through the lives of Martin Luther, John Calvin, and more briefly, several other leaders in the Reformed tradition, such as Pharrell, Bullinger, Ecolampadius, and Zwingli. Now, when you get a letter like that, you have mixed feelings. On the one hand, you're thinking, am I going to get Luther? Am I going to get Calvin? Well, guess what I got? Several other reform leaders. That's what I got. I mean, this is, I, I went on, I kept reading, and it says, we do not want to leave the impression that Calvin was in his own, in, on his own in shaping the reform faith according to the Word of God. So we'd like you to introduce some of those other early figures, such as Pharrell, Bullinger, Ecolampadius, and Zwingli. Now, I am the king of dated pop cultural references. Kevin DeYoung notwithstanding, that whole Uncle Nico and Napoleon Dynamite thing last night, that definitely qualifies as a dated pop cultural reference. But before most of you were born in the 1970s and 80s, uh, everybody knew about the Goodyear blimp. And one of Goodyear's major tire competitors in those days was B.F. Goodrich. And they mounted a, you can imagine the branding problem you have if you are the marketing guy for B.F. Goodrich and everybody knows about Goodyear. And so they mounted an, a marketing campaign in which the theme was, we're the other guys. You know, hey, don't you, aren't you the guys with the blimp? No, we're the other guys. Well, tonight, it's my job to introduce you to the other guys. And I want to introduce you to five of the other guys. Now, you, you will notice in the list that I was given, Pharrell, Bullinger, Ecolampadius, and Zwingli, there are only four. So there is a fifth mystery guy that I want to introduce you to. And we won't necessarily follow this order, Pharrell, Bullinger, Ecolampadius, and Zwingli. In fact, we'll do Zwingli 
Eclampadius, Bullinger, Ferrell. We'll do it backwards, and then I'll introduce my, my mystery guy to you. So let me introduce you to some of my friends. And the first friend that I want to introduce you to is Huldrych Zwingli, or Ulrich Zwingli. He lived from 1484 to 1531. He was born just a couple of months after Martin Luther, to give you some appreciation. They're very, very close contemporaries. Luther lives longer than Zwingli, but they're almost the same age. Zwingli was born in Switzerland, and he became uh, the most important reformer in the Swiss Protestant Reformation of his day. Just like Martin Luther, he accepted the supreme authority of scriptures, but he applied it in a different and more rigorous way to doctrines and practices and especially to worship in the church. It's been said that other than Martin Luther and Henry Bullinger and John Calvin, the most important early reformer was Zwingli. But we don't know a lot about Zwingli in general. So let's spend a little time learning him tonight. Zwingli was a great preacher. In 1519, he did something that was absolutely revolutionary for his day. Um, even amongst the humanist influenced preachers of his time, the normal pattern would have been to preach from the lectionary. You would have followed the church calendar in your preaching. He came in and announced that he was not going to do this. He was going to preach through Bible books. This was revolutionary. This was not done. And he began preaching through the gospel of Matthew. And it was electric in the great minster there as he preached in 1519. In fact, one man who was there, a man named Thomas Platter, listening to Zwingli preach says, it was as if someone was lifting me up by the hair to the ceiling of the building to listen to this man unfold the Word of God. And that kind of excitement about, we're, you mean we're going to get to hear the Bible preached? Electrified people in Zwingli's day. And he, he followed a, a scriptural pattern of working through New Testament books. Zwingli was also a controversialist. That is, he regularly engaged in disputations with Roman Catholic leaders of his day. One of the very important and famous disputations was at Bern in Switzerland. And um, these are the kinds of things that he went into those debates to emphasize. He emphasized, first of all, that the church is born of the Word of God, not the Word of God born of the church. I remember my friend Mark Dever was at a party in Washington, D.C., and a very famous traditionalist Catholic scholar was there, and they were discussing a new volume that had been written on the Protestant Reformation by a critical scholar to some acclaim, and the traditionalist Catholic uh, conversation partner was complimenting this particular academic work, but then he says, you know, it's a very good work, but of course it has that Protestant squint to it. Well, my friend Mark Dever took the bait. Never one not to take the bait, Mark Dever took the bait. And he said, so what do you mean it has that Protestant squint to it? And he said, you know, that all that business about the Word creating the church. I mean, we, we know that it was the church that gave to us the Bible. Oh, you don't say that to Mark Dever. That's no. <laughs> No, he, he started in Genesis and did a biblical theology in which he showed that the Word of God always creates the people of God. The people of God do not create the Word of God. I don't know how long that conversation went on, but poor guy, whoever he was, 
Well, that's one of the things that Zwingli was debating. The church is born of the Word of God, and Christ alone is the head of the church. He argued that the teaching of the church, the practice of the church, the laws of the church are binding insofar only as they agree with Scripture. He argued that Christ alone is man's righteousness. He argued that the Holy Scripture does not teach the corporeal presence of Christ in the bread and wine at the Lord's Supper. Hold that thought. We'll come back to that in a few minutes with our friends Vingley. He taught that the Mass was a gross affront to the completion and sufficiency of the sacrifice and death of Christ. He taught that there was no biblical foundation for the mediation or intercession for the dead, for purgatory, for images, for pictures. And he taught that marriage was lawful for all. And he was a controversialist involved in engaging with the major Catholic scholars of his day. But he also engaged in controversy within the reform movement. Uh, you will remember famously that the Zwinglian-influenced folk in uh, Swiss German, Swiss German-speaking uh, Switzerland and the Lutherans tried to get together at Marburg in 1529 and they agreed on 14 of 15 points of doctrine but they they came to the final point of doctrine and that is what is the nature of the presence of Christ in the bread and the wine in the Lord's Supper and they could not agree and Luther famously said to Zwingli, the Bible says this is my body, and we believe the Bible. And Zwingli responded, we too believe the Bible, but we do not believe that that is what it says. Another part of the disputation, uh, Luther emphasized again, Jesus says this is my body, and Zwingli's followers respond, yes, and he also says, do this in remembrance of me. So Zwingli and Luther were not able to get their parts of the reform movement together because of a difference over the nature of the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Lutheran teaching has been called different things. Consubstantiation is one of the names that has been given to it, but for Luther, the real presence, the corporeal presence of Christ in, when, and under the elements is a very, very important teaching. It's as important to Luther as union with Christ is to reform folk. And they were not able to get together. Interestingly, a number of years later, in the formula of Concord, that great Lutheran document, there is still reference to Zwingli's views. Here's what the formula of Concord says. It is to be noted that in the beginning there are two kinds of sacramentarians. Now when a Lutheran calls you a sacramentarian, he's not giving you a compliment. But the formula of Concord says there are two kinds of sacramentarians. There, there is, there are gross sacramentarians who will declare in plain German clear words as they believe in their hearts that in the Holy Supper nothing but bread and wine is present and distributed and received with the mouth. Others, however, are subtle sacramentarians. And these are the most injurious of all who partly speak very speciously in their own words and pretend that they also believe in the true presence of the essential living body and blood of Christ in the Holy Supper. However, that this occurs spiritually through faith. Nevertheless, they retain under these specious words precisely the former gross opinion, namely that in the Holy Supper nothing is present and received in the mouth except bread and wine. For with them, the word spiritually not, means nothing else that than that the spirit of Christ or the power of the absent body of Christ and his merit which is present 
But the body of Christ is in no mode or way present except only above in the highest heaven to which we should elevate ourselves into heaven by the thoughts of our faith. And there not at all, however, in the bread and wine of the Holy Supper should we seek the body and blood of Christ. This is a, actually a pretty good depiction of Zwingli and Calvin on the Lord's Supper. They, they call Zwingli a gross sacramentarian and Calvin a subtle sacramentarian. Neither of those are compliments. And so Zwingli argued with the Lutherans on the Lord's Supper. Zwingli also took a different tack to the advancement of the Reformation in Zurich. Luther and many of his contemporaries were content to allow civil authorities to advance the Reformation by default. Zwingli actively desired the advancement of the Reformation by civil authorities. He was very deliberate about that. His views might be described as a Rastian. He, he viewed a certain kind of supreme authority in the state or in the city in advancing the Reformation. Now this should remind us, by the way, that views on how the church relate to the state will remain significantly controversial in Reformed Christianity for the next 300 years after Zwingli and will often be the main reason why Christians divide, divide from one another. That should remind us as we address those kinds of questions today to be careful, to seek everything we can to preserve the unity of spirit and the bond of peace as we address these kinds of things together. These things divided even good and great reformers. Zwingli also, were he here tonight, might be called by some a transformationalist, a Kuyperian. He believed in the rule of God extending over all of life, not just over personal life, not just over church life, but over everything. And he was constantly personally involved in political, economic, and military discussions and alliances in order to gain an advantage for the gospel. One time he was asked, Zwingli, what does this have to do with the gospel? They were discussing an economic matter. And Zwingli's answer was, much in every way. Whereas Luther tended to say, preach the gospel and everything else will take care of itself. Zwingli wanted to see the Bible applied to every area of life. Zwingli was a man that believed that Christ and culture interrelate in intricate ways and he believed that Christ was a transformer of culture and that culture should be converted to the glory of Christ. He had what we might call a reformed world and life view. Now again, how the gospel relates to culture, how the Bible relates to culture will be one of the things that will distinguish Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and Cranmer and Knox and others in the Reformation. It will end up being in its specifics a dividing thing. That's a good reminder for us today. I believe that the great challenges for unity in the reformed resurgence that's, that's going on around us today will often come in this area of how we approach culture. And we need to go back and learn from them, learn from their mistakes. One of the things we'll find out is that even in their successes, there are always liabilities no matter what your approach to culture. And so we need to be humble and recognize that this divided early reformers and we need to do what we can to preserve our unity in our own day. Zwingli had a beautiful pulpit prayer that I want to share with you before we go on to our next friend. It goes like this. Almighty God, eternal and compassionate, whose word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, open and enlighten our hearts, that we may understand purely and clearly thy words. May they transform us according to this exact understanding that we may understand 
never be displeasing to thy divine majesty through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let's look at his near contemporary, Ecolampadius. Ecolampadius was born a year before Martin Luther, about two years before Zwingli. He was born in Germany in 1482, and he died in 1531, the same year of Zwingli, just a few months after him in Basel, Switzerland. He was a humanist scholar, a preacher, and a patristic scholar. He was not only a close friend of Zwingli, but he led the Reformation in Basel. He was a student at Heidelberg, and he became a tutor to the elector of the Palatinate, a very important position. He became a preacher early on. He was so good at Greek and Latin and Hebrew that when he moved to Basel, he assisted Erasmus in putting together the Greek New Testament that Erasmus was working on. It was so influential all over Europe in the Reformation. He was also a patristic scholar. This is one of the things that you find amongst the early reformers. They didn't just know their Bibles, they knew the church fathers. So, Eclampadius translated the works of Gregory Nazianzen, Basil, John of Damascus, Chrysostom, Theophylact, and others. He was a great patristic scholar, uh, scholar. And when he engaged with the debates on behalf of the Protestant cause with the Catholic leaders, he could not only debate on exegetical grounds, but he could debate on church histori historical grounds. Eclampadius supported Zwingli's reformation in Zurich. And as you may remember, Zwingli was actually killed in battle, going out with the Swiss army. Though he had, as we heard from Kevin last night, though he had opposed the use of the Swiss mercenaries on behalf of other nations, he died at the Battle of Capel in 1531. Eclampadius was crushed by this. He was shocked by this. And only a few months later, he himself died. But he had been the leader of the church in Basel and in Bern, uh, in uh, Basel and in Zurich as um, Zwingli had been, the head pastor, the lead pastor in the city reformation there. Now we go to our third friend that I want to introduce you to, and that is Henry Bullinger. Henry Bullinger was younger than both Ecolampadius and Zwingli. He was 20 years younger. He wasn't born until 1504, and he lived until 1575. He was a Swiss reformer. He became the successor of Huldrych Zwingli at the Zurich Church and the pastor of the great minster there. Less controversial than Zwingli, Luther, or Calvin. Very committed to bringing together the Reformed cause where he could. He is a person who has long been underestimated and of tremendous influence in the English Reformation. We'll see how in just a few moments. Now, Henry Bullinger was the son of a priest. Let me say that again. Henry Bullinger was the son of a priest. His father was named Henry. And his father was a priest in their hometown. In fact, he was the dean of one of the significant churches in the hometown. And during the early days of the Reformation, his father stood up before the leaders of the town and said, I have been a heretic. The things that I have been teaching have been wrong. He had come under the influence of Protestantism, and he had become a Protestant. And when he announced that he was a Protestant, he lost his job. And so the citizens of the town started interviewing other prospective priests for the church. And one of the people that preached for them was Henry Bullinger. And they said that his sermon thundered as from heaven above. And the people were moved by what young Henry Bullinger preached. And they became Protestants hearing young Henry Bullinger preach. 
Well, Bullinger came to Zurich after Zwingli. And in Zwingli's pulpit also stood up and thundered forth a sermon so that many people said, Zwingli is not dead, but has risen like the phoenix when they heard Henry Bullinger preach. He was 27 years old when he was elected the lead pastor in the city of Zurich. There had been some negotiation about him becoming the pastor. The city council wanted him to agree that he would not criticize them in his sermons. Zwingli was rather famous for criticizing them in their sermons. And they were still sore at Zwingli for leading the troops out in a battle in which the Swiss lost. And so they didn't want Bullinger meddling in their affairs. But eventually, he agreed that he would be free and preach without restriction even if it necessitated his critique of the government. Bullinger was a very prolific preacher and writer. I think I read not long ago Steve Lawson saying that uh, he preached somewhere between seven and seven and a half thousand sermons during his ministry. He wrote a volume of pastoral theology called The Decades, which you can get on Kindle for free. You can get the whole, the whole volume of The Decades, his work on pastoral theology. Now, to give you an idea of his influence, Calvin's Institutes in the 1550s and 60s went through two editions that made their way to England. His decades, Henry Bullinger's decades, went through 127 editions that went to England. In fact, you can argue that Henry Bullinger and Martin Bootser had a greater influence on the early English Reformation than Calvin did. By the way, you want to read Martin Bootser's book, The Cure of Souls one of the best books on pastoral theology you'll ever read. Bullinger had a tremendous correspondence, 12,000 letters he wrote. He wrote to the leading personalities of the Reformation. He wrote to Reformed leaders, Anglican readers, Lutheran leaders, Baptist theologians. He wrote to Henry VIII of England, Edward VI of England, Lady Jane Grey, Elizabeth I, Christian II of Denmark, Philip of Hesse, Frederick III, the Elector of Palatine. He was a prolific correspondent, and he was concerned for the unity of the church. Zwingli was a disputant, and it's true, in his theology, we begin to see the seeds of Reformed theology. If you look at Martin Luther's 95 Theses, you see much attacking unbiblical church practice, but you don't see a rich, full-orbed biblical theology. When you pick up Zwingli's 67 Theses, you begin to see the early shape of Reformed theology. Um, God alone, Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, the cross, all, all of it is there. But Zwingli remained polemical in his relationship with others. Bullinger, uh, he, was, he was deeply concerned with doctrine. He's the prime author of the second Helvetic Confession, which was influential on reform thought years and years after it was written initially for private purposes. But he also cared about unity. It is a conviction that I've been growing in that we think that doctrine must be protected, but we don't think that unity must be protected. And Bullinger understood you can't only stand for doctrine, you have to work for unity. And so he worked for unity with the Lutherans insofar as it could be had, and he worked for unity within the various branches of the Reformed tradition. Henry Bullinger is someone you want to read. By the way, if I could give you a recommendation on reading, it would be as follows. Because I, I know you're not going to read a lot of church history. 
Pick up Nick Needham's little book, 2,000 Years of Christ's Power. It's published by Christian Focus Publication. You can get it on your Kindle if you want. The third volume is on the Reformation and will cover many of these figures. It's easy to read, short sections that tell great stories and will draw you into these people and help you know them better. Then, just read some of the things that they wrote. So, go online and read a free copy of Zwingli's 67 Theses. Or read Diane Poitras's PhD dissertation turned into a book on Ecolampadius. She's the leading Ecolampadius scholar, Vern Poitras' wife. For Bullinger, read the decades. These things are all available to you free. All of the creedal formulations, you can Google them and get them and read them. Read the original sources. The, the humanist scholars that they were studying under had a motto, ad fontis, back to the sources. And why don't you go back to the sources and read some of these great creedal theological statements that they wrote. It'll enrich your heart and life. I want to introduce you to a fourth friend, William Farrell. Now, you heard a little bit about Farrell last night as um, Kevin related the great story of Farrell calling Calvin to Geneva. But Farrell was a great humanist scholar in his own right. He is younger than Zwingli and Ecolampadius, but he's older than Bullinger. He's born in France in 1489, and he dies in Switzerland in 1585. He was the preacher primarily responsible for introducing the Reformation to French-speaking Switzerland. And of course, as you heard last night, he was uh, responsible for getting John Calvin to come to Geneva. He was a student at the University of Paris, and he studied under and was friends with Jacques Lefebvre, who was a very important humanist scholar who influenced Calvin and others. He became the regent of the college there in Paris. He embraced Christian humanism, and he became the preacher for the Reform Bishop in Meaux. As the Reform movement's pace slowed, he eventually found his way to Geneva, and he became the leading French reformer there. He got to Geneva in 1532. He labored for four years, and then he heard that Calvin was coming. Now, you heard the moving story last night, but I want to look at it from the other direction. Farrell was older than Calvin. He was close to 20 years older than Calvin. He invited Calvin to come as his assistant. Calvin came in 1536. By 1538, guess what had happened? Calvin was viewed as an equal with Farrell. Now, how hard would that be? You call your assistant, and three years later, people look to him as much as they look to you. Calvin and Farrell are both together expelled from Geneva in 1538. In 1541, when they are called back, it's of course Farrell who writes to Calvin and says, we've got to go back. And Kevin reminded us of that beautiful response of Calvin. Calvin said, go back to Geneva? I'd rather die than go back to Geneva. But I am not my own. I belong to God. Therefore, I will live for him and die for him. And when they go back, Calvin is the leader. Farrell recognized his own limitations. That again is one of the great lessons of pastoral ministry. I call it the Clint Eastwood rule. A man's got to know his limitations. Farrell realized he could not pull the Reformation off in Geneva. He needed a Calvin. And so he was willing to call a man who was more gifted than he was in order to bless the people of God. Are you ready to minister like that in your local church? 
or wherever you're serving the Lord, to bring someone alongside you who will bless the people and bless the ministry that may garner more praise than you garner, who may be more gifted than you are, but who will serve the interests of God. I think everlastingly one of the great remembrances of Ferrell has to be that he recognized the greatness of Calvin and he was ready to bring him to work at Geneva because he knew that Calvin could do more than he could do even though, like John the Baptist, he would decrease. I think it's one of the great legacies of William Farrell and it's a lesson for all of us today. Would that there were more ministers like this. Now those are the four friends that um, that Don asked me to introduce you to. But I've got a fifth misery friend, and this, is, this has been very hard for me to decide. Who would be this fifth mystery friend that I would introduce you to? It could have been Margaret of Navarre. Ah, not a theologian, but a woman. D- do you understand how strategic women were in the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century? Do you know that one of the great Catholic controversialists of the 16th century complained about the influence of Protestant women? Because very often, the women would become Reformed first, and their Catholic husbands only later. It happened so often that one Catholic controversialist said, drat it. These men go to bed Catholics, and they wake up Protestants. We've got to do something about this. So I could tell you about Margaret of Navarre. Or I could could tell you about Lady Jane Grey, who engaged in that great contest with her Roman Catholic priest interlocutor, who was trying to argue her into believing in transubstantiation. And he says, but my, my lady, Jesus says, this is my body, and Teenage Lady Grain J says, yes, and he also says, I am the door. <laughs> you go, girl. <laughs> or I could tell you about Olympia Morata, who was a first order classical scholar in Latin and in Greek, who wrote treatises on Calvin and Cicero. Here's here's what was said of her. Her spirit revealed all the old classic genius of Greece baptized by the sweetness of Christianity. Is that not glorious? Jerome would be jealous. By birth an Italian introduced to the Reformation in Italy, driven out of Italy by the Inquisition, one of the great Reformed women of 16th century Europe. But I think tonight I'll introduce you to Rene Ferrara. And let me take you back to that scene in 1536 by the inn outside of Geneva when Ferrell comes out to intercept Calvin, who was on his way to Basel to live the quiet life of a scholar. Do you know where Calvin was coming from? Well, in 1533, when Nicholas Kopp gave that address that Kevin talked about last night, and the night the placards occurred, Protestants had to get out of Paris. One of their favorite destinations was the court of René Ferrara, who was a duchess. Her husband was a Catholic, but she was a Reformed Protestant. And she sheltered scholars and supported them even as she supported the poor and needy in her duchy. For one month, John Calvin stayed in her home. And from there, he would eventually make his way to Geneva where he would have that fateful encounter with Ferrell. He had come from Rene Ferrara. Rene Ferrara and John Calvin kept up a correspondence all life long. And she would stand toe to toe with John Calvin. She was not unafraid to debate him. You see, she was a one, she was a woman, 
not only of definite theological convictions, but of royal blood. Rene Ferrara once said, if I had a beard, I'd be the king of France. And it was literally true. If Salic law had not forbidden female succession, she would have been the king of France. What a blessing that would have been for the reform cause in France. When she was very elderly, one of her own relatives was sent by Catholic forces to besiege her city and home. And uh, the Protestants were outnumbered, and the Catholic leader strode to the castle, and she went out front. And she addressed him, and she said this, Malicorn, consider well what you do. For no man in the kingdom has a right to command me but the king. And if you advance, I will put myself foremost in the breach and see whether you have the audacity to kill a king's daughter whose death heaven and earth would avenge on you and your seed even to the children of the cradle. He and his troops withdrew. (laughs) That is... Your sister in Christ, Renee Ferrara, a duchess, a reformed Protestant. And her story can be told over and over and over in the 16th century through the women of the Reformation. Please, please read Roland Bainton on the women of the Reformation as he talks about the women of the Reformation in Germany and Italy, from Spain to Scandinavia, from France to England. The women of the 16th century Protestant Reformation were a powerful force for the gospel. Thank you for listening tonight. Let's pray and ask for God's help and blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these five friends that we've met tonight. And we pray that their example would spur us on to love and good deeds, to fidelity and boldness. And we pray that we would be faithful to the one who gave himself for them and for us, even Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.